Welcome to the final installment in our State Park's favorite series. We've done hiking, beaches, and best for families, or favorites for families, and now we're doing just sort of the quirky favorites that we think don't get enough love, but are special in their own way. We just want you to know more about them. And as we've said from the beginning, this series was about favorites. It's a very subjective list. It's just things that, you know, parks that stuck out to us or things at the parks that stuck, that stuck out to us that we thought you should know about and, and consider going to see these parks because of that. In this case, we looked at it from a standpoint of a lot of it has to do with history or we said, is there something quirky about it? And as we narrowed our list down, I think we realized that the history is often what makes it quirky. <laughs> um, so it's a little bit of a combination of that. But here's a look at some of our favorite state parks in Michigan because of either their history or their quirkiness or combination. Kicking things off in no particular order is Hartwig Pine State Park, located in northern central Michigan, roundabout up here. And it is the second largest in the Lower Peninsula. And it has a lot of different features to it that make it kind of unique. It has old growth forests, which I think is one of the coolest parts about it. Um, it was actually land that was owned by a lumber company, and then they didn't end up harvesting all of the original timber that was there. And actually, I think it was Karen Hartwick is the person who ended up buying the property from her father and then donated it to the state. So we still have old growth forests, which is not something you usually see in Michigan anymore. As a result of that old growth forest, the other part of Hartwick Pines that is really unique is the logging museum that is located right there on the grounds. And this is a throwback and essentially a reenactment recreation of what the lumber camps used to look like that were scattered throughout Michigan. And so you can go in the old buildings and see what life was like for the people who lived there and worked there and kind of experience it for yourself and learn the history of what it was like to be a lumberman, you know, back in Michigan's uh, old time. They have a lot of the equipment there that they use, which really gives you an idea of how big some of the original trees were in Michigan. Oh gosh, yeah. uh, and there are some weekends when they do reenactments. They have actors there who come out and, and dress in period clothing and make period food, which we enjoyed some biscuits, if I remember <laughs> correctly. I still remember the biscuits made over the fire, so that was really cool. As part of the old growth part of the park, too, you still have the old growth trail. So what trees remain from the original forest are still there, and you can wander through and see them. A big section of it, like dozens of acres, was lost at one time, so there used to be more. The Old Growth Trail is really neat because it gives you sort of a glimpse of what some mm -hmm. of the original trees would have been like. The ones we have now and what they consider the Old Growth Trail are small in comparison to some of the original trees that were cut for timber in Michigan, but it's still neat to see what's there now. Another favorite of ours is Mayberry State Park in Wayne County, so in southeast Michigan. And it is, in fact, the first state park in Wayne County. So that makes it kind of unique just on its own. But what makes Mayberry really special and unique in our minds is its history and how it came to be. It was the site of a tuberculosis sanatorium that was actually there from 1921 all the way to 1969 and housed both adults and children who were recuperating from TB. And they didn't really have any treatment for TB at the time. In fact, it was thought of early on that fresh air was good for people and it would help them. And I think it probably helped them maybe feel better. It didn't really cure anybody of it, but it actually started as a way to take people from Detroit in that immediate city area and get them out of the city, somewhat quarantine them and, and put them in their own outdoor area where they could supposedly get better. It was just really interesting to hear about that history because we don't often hear about those kind of diseases anymore. That's probably a good thing that we don't hear about them anymore. Now, if you go to Mayberry, you're not going to necessarily see all of the buildings and structures that made up that sanatorium, as many of them have been taken down. But we really enjoyed that the park has done a great job of providing interpretive signs where those buildings once stood. And some of the foundations are still there. The buildings themselves just aren't. So you can get a pretty good feel for what it was like there in the space that they had in the land. And at one time, there was a working farm that was the farm that fed uh, all the people that lived there. And the farm actually is still there. It's now part of a, a private entity. It's not part of the state park, but it is still located right next door. But it's just really cool because Mayberry has a lot of trails. Um, that's really what it's known for now is its extensive trail system. And as you go along those trails, you get to learn about the history of the sanatorium. 
And there are different kinds of trails. So depending on what you want to do, there is a paved trail system that's sort of a multi-use. So you can hike on it or you can use bikes. And then there's also more of a gravel type trail system that's used primarily for biking. But as you go around, yeah, it's really neat to see those signs and learn about the history. And if you go, I would give yourself some time to kind of stop and read those signs and, and think about what was going on at the time and what people went through. It, it's a really unique park in that way because of its history. And it's in Wayne County, which is a very populated area. But I noticed when we were in there, it was really kind of serene. You got in there and you were away from kind of the hustle and bustle. And it was nice to kind of get away from the city life and kind of learn a bit about the history and enjoy some peace and quiet. Third on our list, and the state park that I think has the most unique feature of all of the parks in the system, is the Sanilac Petroglyph State Park. This park has exactly what it sounds like petroglyphs, which are not super unusual in Michigan, but the quantity and the location of them is what really makes this one unique. It is a day use park located in the Thumb, and it is open as most day use parks are in the state park system. So it's kind of a dawn to dusk sort of thing. But something really important is if you go to see the petroglyphs, they are locked up behind a fence now because of damage and, and vandalism that's occurred over the years. So they keep them locked up and that's only open until Five. I think it's 10 to 5 is their, when they're open daily. But if you get a chance, go during that time and so you can get inside the fence mm -hmm. and get a close-up look at those petroglyphs. They're really cool and, and they've been able to preserve them pretty well at this point now. Yeah, I really enjoyed seeing them and the park ranger who is always stationed there will be able to give you some of the history on what each of the symbols means. And you know there's dots in a row and that indicates north and then there's like a bird and that you know those are the different symbols of the tribes that used to be in the area and so it's just really cool to see and and experience that for yourself one of the things that the ranger can tell you more about or you can look this up online is how they even came to find the petroglyphs it's essentially in this case it's one big rock um, where they've discovered them there, there probably were more at some time but this is what they've been able to find and the only reason they even found these was because a huge fire went through the area in the mid 1800s and it burned away all the trees, leaving these sandstone features, you know, out in the open. And that's when they were discovered. Another piece of history you can learn about if you take the trails that are throughout the park is about actually two major fires in the 1800s that occurred in the Thumb. Massive fires, like hundreds of acres burned. People lost their lives. We lost villages and mm -hmm. towns. They were just massive. One of the fires I've learned was actually the first time the Red Cross responded to that type of an incident. So that's kind of a bit of history there. And there's some signs throughout the park that talk about that as well. But that, that was just sort of an interesting piece of history that I actually didn't know anything about until we got there was the giant fires in the 1800s that occurred in the thumb. We do really encourage you to check this one out because it is super cool. It is a day use only park. There, I think it's like two picnic tables, but really all you're there for is to see the petroglyphs. And then you can go on this like loop uh, trail walk through the park and that's really cool as well but get over there and check it out moving back down to southeast michigan for our next park is highland recreation area which is actually in oakland county and this also has some unique history the land was originally owned by etzel ford son of henry ford of ford automobile fame and he actually had a lodge there it was their weekend getaway it is built on the highest point in oakland county and i'm sure they had a great view of rural oakland county at the time and if you need a weekend getaway 2400 acres up on a hill is not a bad way to go <laughs> but um the lodge is no longer there it burned actually i think back in the late 80s the early 90s, 90s yeah. somewhere in there um but there are some buildings still there and they have done a really good job with pointing out uh, where the parts of the lodge were and you can learn about it and you can learn about the people who visited over time. This park is full of history um, and sometimes we don't always think about the the full history in context with each other. For instance, they had this awesome lodge and that meant that they had some awesome visitors which included Charles Lindbergh and Thomas Edison and sometimes you just don't think about those people all being together at the same time in the same history but they were all friends and so you know they once visited this place and it was just really cool to kind of walk around and think about them stepping foot there and the things they must have talked about. These people were all very brilliant and, and engineers of different kinds. And so they had built like this 
you know, ski contraption, you know, like way ahead of its time to like haul your sleds up and down the hill. And, you know, and they ran electricity from essentially nowhere into their barn. And so it was just kind of cool to think about and be there. And while the lodge, unfortunately, is not there, the carriage house still is. And you can see what the lodge would have looked like, essentially what how it was made and what was constructed by looking at the carriage house. Um, and then there's just uh, there's just a lot of other outbuildings that are technically are still there and part of it, an old barn um, that was the stables. And they did a really good job of putting interpretive signs out where those buildings used to be or even where some of them still are. Um, we kind of had to laugh because it was the you auto know, like A-U-T-O, um, signs that's kind of what they call them but it was it was really fun to kind of walk around and, and learn the history of the place i'm pretty sure a dad was involved with making those signs it, <laughs> oh, it's like a giant so dad it's joke. like an ongoing dad joke throughout the whole park um it's actually the haven hill estate is what it's called was Elton ford's estate and i bring that up because when we did the research for this park we thought we were going to go on some trails and it was a really big park and everything there really wasn't anything about haven hill mm -hmm. or about the estate we sort of stumbled onto it while we were there and there's a tremendous amount of history so if you look up Highland Recreation Area, you may find out about the trails and things to do there, but you may not see a lot about Haven Hill unless you go looking for it. So I bring that up because I think that's a sort of a, a hidden part of that park that you really need to check out. That is important to note because you probably won't find anything out about this when you get there. Um, but plan a lot of extra time if you do want to go check it out. I think that was our one mistake was not knowing anything about it. We expected to kind of be in and out of there in an hour or two. And I think we spent four uh, because there was so much to see and read and just experience. Um, and so, you know, just kind of take that into consideration when you go visit. But what's really cool is even though this is a metropolitan area and it is really busy where the park is located, once you're in the park, you feel like you're out in the middle of nowhere. And I'm sure that's why the Fords chose that location even way back when was because it does kind of get you out away from the hustle and bustle. So it's a great place to go check out the trails. You can bring your horse because they have equestrian trails, bring your bike, bring your dog, bring your whole family and go visit. For our final official favorite of Michigan's quirky state parks, we bring you Rockport. Rockport is located kind of over here on the eastern northern side of the state. And while there really isn't a whole lot there in terms of development, um, what is there is really cool. The two biggest features of this park are fossils and sinkholes. The area used to be a giant quarry and ships would come into the harbor, they'd get loaded up and cart everything away. And essentially what was left was just all these remnants of rocks and people discovered over the years that it was a huge fossil bed. And so now that the quarry is officially closed, people are going in there and turning up all sorts of fossils. We were really lucky that the day we visited, we were able to meet up with the head ranger and we got a, a quick tour and a kind of behind the scenes look at Rockport. Um, but he commented that pretty much anywhere you walk around this quarry, if you stop and look at a rock or break open a rock, you're going to find a fossil. Everything from just, you know, little tiny stuff. He said they found prehistoric fish that were like nine feet long and then they've tried to reassemble them. So I don't have patience for puzzles. I'm pretty sure I'm not building fossils, but it was really neat to, to see those. And then you mentioned fossils and sinkholes, those are both there, but they're not related. I don't want people to think you have to go to the sinkhole to get a fossil. <laughs> That's in the quarry. The, well, sinkhole, the sinkholes are in a completely separate area and also a very cool part of this park. The deal with this park right now is that there really isn't a whole lot there. And in fact, it's really even hard to get to where the fossils and the sinkholes are. There are a few trails that take you out to them, but the wayfinding signs keep getting eaten by the porcupines. So the rangers don't necessarily really want you out there right now just because you can get lost pretty easily. Um, but they're really hoping to develop this and they have grand plans to make this an awesome state park with multiple campgrounds and trails of all kinds and for hiking and biking. And they really want to develop this because those unique features of the sinkholes and the fossils are really cool and they want people to experience them because that's not something that you're going to find at any other state park. This is one of those parks where if you go now, take a lot of pictures and then you can go back years later and you can show your kids and your grandkids and say, I remember when there was nothing here. Lots of potential in this park, but check it out now. It's really unique in its own way and that's why it made our favorites list. That's a wrap on our five favorite quirkier historical state parks. But we wanted to do a list of a few honorable mentions, parks that made our original list, but get a lot more attention than the ones we already provided. 
So make sure you don't miss these. That would include Belle Isle down in Detroit, which is very unique and a lot of history there. And then the other three actually are all in the Upper Peninsula, but that includes um, Fayette, Fort Wilkins, and Palms Book State Park, home of the Big Spring, which is what it's called. And it's what I call it because I can't pronounce the Indian name. Kitchita Kippy. That. You want to see the Big Spring. <laughs> it's really cool. All of those are cool. All 103 state parks in Michigan have their own uniqueness. They all have a history. Um, you did a great job, I thought, as we put together the project initially last year. You spent a lot of time researching the history of the parks. And we sort of did it so we'd have some information and some things to talk about. And I, I, maybe for you, for me, it ended up being one of my favorite parts was we found out so much history about the state parks, but also about the state and the area that these parks are in. I just thought that was a really great way to do that. And I appreciate that you put all that work into it. Thanks. I had a lot of fun doing it and I didn't do it as much early on until we got going on some of them. And I realized how rich the history really was uh, of not just the state parks, but how they were all interconnected to each other and with the state's history in general. And that was kind of a bonus uh, to doing this project was learning that. And I hope that is if you followed along with the series, you've learned that as well. And if you're just new to this series, please go back and watch some of those, especially um, to learn some of that history, because we found it fascinating and you'll have a much better appreciation of the parks that you visit. So when you visit any of the 103 state parks, watch for those historical markers and signs. There's a lot of information and it's a lot of fun to learn more about the state that you're in. Keep on trekking. And we'll see you out there. Third on our list. And the park that I think has the most unique feature in all of the state park systems is, what is the actual name of this park? Sanilac Petroglyph <laughs> State Park. Okay, thanks. I realized I had no idea where I was going. Shoot, now I gotta start over. 